Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to uh, this lunchtime event. I'm Nick Pierce. I'm the director of the Institute for Public Policy Re for Research at the University of Bath and um, uh, professor of public policy. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Stefan Eich. Um, Stefan is an assistant professor of government at Georgetown University, and he's here today to talk to us about his latest book, The Currency of Politics, The Political Theory of Money from Aristotle uh, to Keynes. And Stefan's uh, research focuses on political theory, intellectual history, uh, and the history of political thought, particularly uh, the political theory of money uh, and financial capitalism. And we are often used to thinking about money in our societies as a sort of neutral medium of exchange, as somehow above politics, the actions of central banks and others being, as it were, politically neutral, uh, having no, as it were, political consequences or um, political uh, determination. And in his book, The Currency of Politics, um, Stefan provides uh, a, a different approach to these questions, one that challenges some of the ways in which we often debate and think about money in our public discourse, um, providing an intellectual history of money that draws on insights of political philosophers from Aristotle to John Maynard Keynes. And in a minute, you'll hear him uh, challenge us to think more deeply about the place of money in our society and in our democratic politics. What does it mean to think about regulating money? How can we make money more democratic? What is the place of money in our society? And these are issues which are, are really pertinent to our current debate. You know, we've um, in the UK just had uh, the announcement of our latest inflation figures, the prospect of another rise in interest rates from the central bank. All of these things have political consequences, distributional consequences, issues for our economy and society. And so to understand the political theory of money uh, from Stefan today, I think would be a very useful way for us to approach some of these discussions that we're having, you know, very much in real time in our societies today. So a very big welcome um, uh, to you, Stefan. I'm very glad you can join us. I know you're speaking to us from uh, the east coast of the US, where it's a lot earlier in the morning than it is uh, here. We're at lunchtime here in the UK. So thank you very much indeed. Um, there'll be an opportunity for everybody to uh, ask questions to debate uh, after you've heard uh, Stefan's talk. If you've got any questions, put them in the um, Q&A function. We'll, we'll pick them up uh, and then I, I can uh, put them to Stefan uh, once he's given us his, his talk. So a very big welcome to you, Stefan. Thanks very much and over to you. Thank you so much, Nick, for that kind introduction and thank you for having me. And thanks to the Institute for Policy Research for inviting me and to Amy Thompson and uh, Julia Kleinkamp for organizing the lecture. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be here, um, despite the time difference and despite the fact it's only on Zoom. Um, before I start, I should apologize because there is a possibility that you'll hear my dog bark in the background. So apologies of that if that happens. Um, it's the time of day in the US when some of the mail gets delivered. So, But um, what I want to talk to you today about is um, taken from my recent book, which Nick mentioned, The Currency of Politics, The Political Theory of Money from Aristotle to Keynes, which grapples with debates over the politics of money and in particular monetary crises in the history of political thought. And so what I have in mind for today is taking you on at least part, a small part of the journey that has occupied me as I wrote this book, which came out last year. Now, before I get uh, into the book um, and take us into the history of monetary crises and our own crises, I just want to start by defamiliarizing money a little. I think we just realize all too rarely how peculiar it is. And money indeed seems to often work best when it remains unthought. And so I want to kind of just begin by pushing back against that a little bit and just ask you to kind of look with me at this five pound note, just stare at it for a little too long. Um, in fact, soon it'll be this one. But, but what is this we're looking at? Is it, is it money? What makes this particular piece of paper or plastic different from other pieces of paper? I like just like try to stay with the kind of dizziness, wonder and curiosity that comes when you begin to wonder what exactly happens when you use cash or indeed a touchless card to pay for your coffee. What exactly is going on here? Now, before I get deeper into what money is and what that tells us about the politics of money, um, let me just give you a brief outline of um, what I have in mind for the next half an hour or so. Um, first, I'll provide you with just some basic conceptual grounding by laying out what I take money to be and how I look at it as a political theorist. And this allow me to say something more about the way in which the book works through 
different monetary crises in order to set up a kind of mapping exercise of various positions available to us today. Um, and I'll outline two of these positions specifically with regard to Locke and Fichte. Um, then turning to the present, I'll just close with some brief thoughts on where exactly this leaves us today, right? In a moment of interregnum, I'll argue, surrounded by struggles over the hybrid status of money between public infrastructure and private speculation. So that's the, that's the roadmap of what's ahead. But first, some conceptual and historical clarifications out of the way on what money is. It's actually a somewhat deceptive question for reason that you'll see, but we have to start somewhere. And so let me just put my cards on the table um, and say that I tend to think of money most fundamentally and most broadly speaking as a form of circulating debt or credit. It's essentially an IOU that just happens to be widely accepted in a certain area or a certain community. Most likely, though not necessarily, because a state has declared it legal tender, settled debts, and specifically tax debts. I think here of the promise that, that's printed on every single pound note. This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. And understood in this way, as a unit of account to keep track of debt, money is at least as old as Sumerian and Babylonian accounting systems. Now, this understanding of money, which I think is actually now fairly widely accepted, has two immediate implications. The first one is that it inverts older accounts that you might still be familiar with from standard economics textbooks that presented a gradual procession from barter to metal money to credit money. So instead, it's credit from the very beginning with all its connotations of belief, faith, trust. There's been a lot of work on this in particular among economic anthropologists over the last few decades. And I think it's now actually reached the economics profession as well. Secondly, money is not a thing, but an idea. It's a form of collective belief, the creditor, and a measure of value. And so we might use objects and tokens, like the node I showed you, as representations of value, and in order to denote that a certain debt has been settled. But actually, strictly speaking, these are not money. So it's actually quite misleading to think of that five pound note with which we started as money. Instead, money is really the collective idea behind it. There's a, there's a famous um, line by John Maynard Keynes to describe this mistake, um, where he says, to mistake a kind of a lump of metal or indeed a piece of paper for money, is like confusing a theater ticket with the performance itself. So note, first of all, that this means that the kind that the kind of you know debate about the cashless society implying the end of money completely confuses what's going on here. Instead, what changes is simply the kind of money that we use, namely new various forms of private money. Most money, you know, something like 97, 98% uh, in the UK is already just virtual money in bank accounts, precisely not physical cash. Right? So money is already dematerialized to an overwhelming extent. More abstractly, what this means is that money is essentially a form of kind of collective belief and specifically collective beliefs about the future. And to stay with Keynes, one can say that money is you know, first and foremost an institution of embodied temporality. Keynes wrote um, in the general theory that money is above all a subtle device for linking the present to the future. And this makes money a uniquely self-reflexive institution in which certain expectations about the future can easily become self-fulfilling or self-defeating. Now, all this amply illustrates, and this is where we're moving into territory more familiar to political theorists, um, the way in which money is not merely a neutral economic technology, but a site of manifold political struggles. More specifically, there's a particular kind of power associated with money that is not merely the power that derives from having money, but the power that derives from being able to create money and the power to govern that creation of money. Closely linked to this, money and banking are never purely private, but they remain tethered to the state and its central banks. So even money created by banks you know, in bank deposits, the kind of 97% that we saw is ultimately backstopped by the state. 
put together, this kind of provides a picture of money as suspended between trust and violence, to use an expression that I built on, taking from the work by two French economic sociologists, Michel Ayeta and André Orléans. And as such, money really is a constitutional project. What stands out if we turn to the history of political thought is that it appears again and again in various different guises as a fragile project of law and language with unique promises and challenges, in particular for democratic politics. Now, one way to spell that out is to appreciate the way that there can be very different forms of money based on different conceptions of politics. So while money in the abstract sense has been around for a very long time, I mentioned Babylonia, there are moments in which new forms of money appear. And in particular in these moments, one can witness struggles over the politics of money. And one such instance, to take us back, not quite all the way through the back to the beginning, but to quite some time ago, one such instance is the emergence and the rapid spread subsequently of coined money issued by city states around sometime like the seventh century BC. Now, beforehand, most transactions, especially long distance trade, was conducted in weighed gold and silver, like little lumps of metal, little ingots. So while money existed in that form for millennia, the invention of coinage in the seventh century BC in Lydia, in what is now Turkey, added a completely new political dimension to this. And interestingly, something similar happened roughly contemporaneously in India and China. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the Greek case because that's the one I know best and that's the one that informs the kind of history of Western political thinking about money. But it's important to appreciate that the ancient Greek polis where we get so many of our ideas and words um, about politics from, emerged alongside a new monetary institution that politicized money in the form of coinage. And you can witness this struggle in the language. So the ancient Greek word for coinage, nomisma, referred most generally to anything that was collectively sanctioned, anything that was an embodiment of collective belief. And as such, it has a shared root with the Greek word for a new kind of law, nomos, that is instituted by and for the political community. And you can see this imprint um, of the political significance of coined money as a relatively recent innovation in many Greek thinkers, but I think nowhere more clearly than in Aristotle, for whom coinage issued by the polis occupied a crucial place in his account of political justice. I'll keep this very brief here, but to kind of summarize, currency essentially equalizes for Aristotle. And so exchange conducted in coinage is a crucial source of reciprocity in the just city. So perhaps surprisingly from our perspective, that means that coinage can, at least in theory, resemble and assist law and speech in making unequals equal, in sustaining civic trust and recognition among citizens. More concretely, that means that coins, as really the only mass medium of antiquity, inserted the imagined community of the polis symbolically into acts of exchange. Now, for Aristotle, all this, of course, assumes that money is used in the right way, both individually and politically, namely that it's used as a tool to live the good life and to strive for justice politically. Um, but Aristotle is at the same time deeply skeptical over whether that is actually what will happen. He's acutely aware of all the seductive pitfalls that money provides. And I think it's telling that he ends the discussion of money in book one of the politics with the figure of Midas, right? Whose greed became his curse and who died as a result of his greatest wish having been fulfilled, namely that everything he would touch would turn into gold, including all the food he tried to eat. So reading Aristotle in this light alongside the spread of coinage nonetheless allows for a kind of striking reframing of money in the history of political thought. Yes, to be sure, like as an insatiable and disruptive force that always threatens to corrupt political life, which is here symbolized in this kind of Dutch golden age painting by King, the Lydian King Croesus on the left sitting on his throne. But also crucially often in response as a potential tool of civic reciprocity and even political justice, here symbolized by Solon on the right, the Athenian lawgiver, and crucially monetary reformer, kind of pointing back at us 
in this painting. Okay, so what do we do with this? Um, for almost 2000 years, almost all subsequent accounts of money have felt it necessary to grapple with Aristotle's conception of money as a conventional tool of justice. With intensely argued debates over what precisely this means for the political control of the currency, who was allowed to control this monetary tool. And in the rest of the book, I kind of use this framing as a lens to look at a series of modern monetary crises to see how different modern thinkers grappled with this ambivalent legacy, both of money as both a political but also an economic institutions, in particular in moments of monetary crisis. Now, the history of political thinking, you can already tell this from the structure of the book, is, I think, closely tied to crises. I think one can even say that it accumulates in layers of crises. So you find this striking image of long periods of relative calm and relative lack of interest in the political theory of money, kind of interrupted again and again by moments of violent crises that kind of force contemporaries to look at money with fresh eyes and that sends them back into the past in search for orientation. And so in following these different layers of crises, I've been kind of trying to produce some sort of geological mapping of the political theory of money that chronicles these different layers and the positions embodied in them. Now, that mapping can provide us, I think, with some much needed orientation also today, both conceptually and historically. It can remind us of the deep roots of many familiar positions, but it can also bring into view aspects that have become obscured over time, connections, links, and so on. Now, crucially, the map doesn't tell us where to go. It can give us a better sense of orientation, however, of where we might want to end up and how to get to a place that we pick. It can help us to figure out how we can get to wherever we want to go. Now, to illustrate what I have in mind here, this is all fairly abstract. Let me just give you two very brief examples of this, two ways in which Aristotle's starting point about the conventional nature of money as a political institution was reinterpreted in two radically different ways in modernity. And so I just want to give you the example of John Locke and the German philosopher uh, Johann Gottlieb Fichte. So first, Locke. I obviously don't have time to take you into the historical context or offer a full reading of Locke's text, but I do want to briefly take you into the coinage crisis of 1695 and Locke's influential essays on the coinage crisis. It really turned English monetary policy on its head. Um, if you think this is all a little bit, um, you know, obscure, I just uh, ask you to keep in mind that this was the topic of Kwasi Kwarteng's dissertation. So we're, talk we're talking about the, um, the coinage crisis that continues to have uh, an effect on contemporary British politics. Now, to summarize the, the context for the crisis, by the end of the 17th century, there was a widespread coin clipping that occurred, which essentially meant that there was a chronic shortage of coins and that those coins that were circulating had a silver value far below their nominal value. Now, this was something that had happened many times before, and the usual measure had always been to kind of gather up all the existing silver coins, melt them down, and then adjust the nominal value so that there would be more of them after a recoinage. Locke vehemently disagreed with that option because he thought that the state was essentially behaving like a coin clipper itself by breaking the original promise of how much silver was meant to be in a particular coin. Instead, Locke insisted on metal money's intrinsic value and he called for a full recoinage, but at the old rate, which would restore the size of the coins, but produce even fewer coins than there were before. And it's a surprise of many contemporaries, Locke's recommendation actually won out and it produced a wholesale recoinage without devaluation. Now, perceptive readers of Locke have tended to see in this an early instance of a naturalization of money, a kind of Polanian disembedding, according to which control over money moved from the state to the market. And there is, of course, something to it. But rather than taking a look at face value, I think it's better to think of this insistence on intrinsic value as itself a political strategy. 
For even on Locke's own terms, intrinsic value turns out to be defined, not as naturally given, not as defined by the market, but as an initially arbitrary, but then unalterable quantity of silver set by the sovereign authority. So what Locke called intrinsic value originated paradoxically in pure fiat. Now, what motivated and grounded this intervention was then interestingly not a straightforward naturalization of money, fixed and given, but on the contrary, the old Aristotelian premise that money-like language was built on convention and characterized by semantic fragility, which rendered it prone to corruption. So money is established by mere fancy or agreement, as Locke puts it in the second treatise. It has a fantastical val imaginary value. In an important sense, that means that money is like language. But unlike language, in the case of money, Locke argues, the sovereign can artificially tie value to metal and thereby stabilize the otherwise inherently fickle. Now, wh why, why care about this? Um, why do I tell you this? I think this Lockean politics of monetary depoliticization had a very distinguished history, not just in accounts of sound money in the 19th century, but I think also um, it's, able, it's possible to detect echoes of this discourse in contemporary accounts of kind of the Odyssean self-binding of independent central banks, right? Of banks that have to, central banks that have to be shielded from democratic politics. Now we can celebrate this as kind of you know a far-sighted effort of democratic self-binding, but we could also, of course, look at it as a form of self-imposed dependency, and most likely it's both of the two. But irrespectively, we're now firmly in the realm of politics, and that means that the modern politics of modern modern monetary depoliticization can never be fully closed off, but it remains open to political contestations. It's a political argument rather than one about nature or economic theory. Okay, so that's one way of looking at uh, the modern politics of money, but it's not the only one. I just wanna give you Fichte here as a compressed counter example. So roughly a hundred years after Locke in a different monetary crisis after or during the Napoleonic Wars rather, Fichte returned to these fundamental questions and he came up with a radically different answer. He also starts with the premise that money is a conventional institution that in many ways resembles language, but the kind of money in use has changed since Locke. At the 18th century witnessed the meteoric rise of public credit and with it new forms of paper money that by the end of the century culminated in various experiments with what we would now call fiat money. This paper money backed solely by the promise of the state in this context. So armed with sophisticated philosophies of language, Fichte argued that contrary to widespread expectations, you know, these new forms of fiat money could not only work, but that they contained underappreciated political possibilities. So it was in this light that he began to look at fiat money as a kind of social contract. Like a social contract, the collective fiat of currencies rested on a collective exchange of promises, mutual promises that extend into the future. So rather than concluding that money needed to be stabilized by somehow being tied to metal, Fichte thought it had to be republicanized. And he built on this insight a bold call for the transition from metal money to fiat currency. So that was a kind of frankly visionary description of how a rational state could control the money supply in order to achieve its economic and political goals. This is um, from Fichte's Closed Commercial State from 1800, where he writes, precisely because the value of world currency, and he's thinking of gold and silver money, the value of world currency to goods has no other guarantee than public opinion. This ratio is just as fluctuating and variable as public opinion itself. The national currency, this is the fiat currency, would in contrast have an entirely different guarantee, since it would have to be a fundamental law of the state that it will maintain it at its value among the fellow citizens. So rather than chaining yourself to the kind of fluctuating uh, value of gold on the world market, or which you have no influence, which might go up, which might go down, a, a rational state with a central bank can actually control the value of money. Right? There are constitutional worries about whether it's able to do that at all times, but you know, in theory, 
that's that's the promise of fiat money. So fiat money, according to Fichte, enabled an extension of the social contract essentially into the economic realm. And this implied for Fichte, most controversially, an external commercial closure of the state, as well as a radical call, not only for civic equality and economic equality, but a right to work. It's an ingenious kind of reworking of a locking account of property as implying a right to work, um, which is also in that, in that text, the closed commercial state. And you can clearly hear echoes um, of contemporary debates over MMT, monetary sovereignty, um, that, that I kind of bring out in, intentionally. Um, I think they are they are there. Okay, so, so I've given you these two examples of how Locke and Fichte developed two divergent accounts of the politics of money from fairly similar premises, how they inaugurated positions that have recognizable contemporary echoes. One can create a whole map of what that looks like. I don't have time to do this now, but um, I just want to briefly flag John Maynard Keynes as one particularly interesting and important perspective here, because he does not so much stand simply in one of these traditions, but instead moves over this map like a spider, kind of seeking to reconcile seemingly contrary positions. So Keynes argues against Locke that monetary politics cannot solely be based on depoliticized stability not least because a failure to take social justice into account would itself endanger stability, which is a very Rawlsian argument. Instead for Keynes, um, you know, arguing alongside Fichte in some way, deliberate discretionary control over the currency and credit will be required. And yet at the same time, Keynes insists that money and the control over credit has to be shielded from popular politics since it requires special expertise. So you see him kind of working different arguments together from various traditions. And I'm happy to say more about um, Keynes and, and, and um, you know, that, that position in the Q&A. So I'm actually now working more on Keynes's political thought. But where does this leave us um, today to kind of turn to the present? I do think we are kind of stuck. Um, perhaps not hopelessly so, but I do think that we live um, in what Adam Tooze and others have called with a nod to Gramsci, a moment of monetary interregnum, where the myth of neutral money, you know, money beyond politics essentially is dead. But to, to quote um, Adam Tooze, a fully political money that really dares to speak its name has not yet been born. So the old model of neutral money is gone. The legitimacy of the current institutional setup is severely strained but it's not at all clear what could possibly replace it. In other words, it's more and more obvious that monetary policy decisions are not just technical, but they're the deeply political ones with very clear winners and losers. I mean, think of the impact of the interest rate hikes um, or internationally think of the weaponization of the global dollar system in response to the war in Ukraine. And yet central bankers have largely doubled down on their pretense of apolitical expertise as the source of their legitimacy, even if it leads to more and more bizarre and paradoxical rhetorical acrobatic, not least the paradox that the more uncertain the world becomes, the less central bankers can acknowledge their own ignorance. Now, the beginning of this monetary interregnum can I think be dated back to the financial crisis of 2008, which now seems itself half a lifetime ago. But it was with the financial crises and the spectacle of bailouts that debates about the political status of money returned really for the first time since the 1970s. Right? So the crises and the bailouts really served as a reminder that money had never been a neutral tool beyond politics and had lifted the veil of mystification, drew the repressed fictitiousness of money back into the open. It also illustrated the ways in which the politics of money, both domestically and internationally, had become absolutely central to the way liberal democracies govern themselves, while revealing at the same time that the underlying questions remain entirely unresolved and had been hidden for far too long from public debate. Now, this has all changed since 2008, and dramatically so, and especially over the last three years you know, you can see a compressed version of this from the COVID monetary emergency measures um, that once more just powerfully illustrated the extraordinary force that central banks can exercise if they decide to do so, to the, the onset of inflation, which I think has further discredited the already fragile institutional prestige of central banks around the world. 
Now, we're nonetheless, I think, still in this moment of interregnum, and that comes with its own challenges, not least that it produces what Gramsci called morbid symptoms. And, you know, there has been no shortage of morbid symptoms during this period. You know, not least, as I would argue, the spectacular rise of crypto. And it's helpful to remember here that crypto itself originates out of that moment of the financial crises and its bank bailouts, right? The Bitcoin Genesis block includes an explicit reference to the British bank bailouts from January 2009. But the more fundamental point is that the financial crises made the contested political status of money visible again, right? That has invited, on the one hand, once more attempts to privatize money, to remove it from the state and now tie it to algorithms. But the crisis also produced calls for a repoliticization of monetary policy and the need for global monetary reform. And one really has to go back all the way to the 1970s to find anything remotely resembling this. And I find um, placing crypto into these struggles helpful because the political status of money you know, becomes uh, more visible um, when you appreciate the debates and struggles fought over it. It allows us to see that the kind of politics that lurks behind the removal of money from questions of trust. Right? So we shouldn't take the rhetoric of convenience and technology at face value, but instead understand it as based on a particular politics of de-democratization, of removing money from the realm of democracy, an attempt to privatize money, um, as was, I think, the case most explicitly with Facebook's failed stablecoin project. Now, in many ways, crypto's challenge to the political public nature of money has turned out to be a dead end, um, at least for genuine cryptocurrencies like, like Bitcoin, which simply turned out to be far too volatile to effectively serve as a unit of account. And many um, crypto advocates have ditched this idea that crypto is the future of money and instead started to pitch it simply as a speculative asset a kind of ticket to quick wealth in a world in which net wealth is increasingly a privilege of the few. And there's a deep irony here, of course, because the idea of crypto as the future of money ugly fell victim to its own success as a speculative asset. But there's a, there's a deeper um, normative question at stake here when we turn to debates over so-called central bank digital currencies. Right? So if money is a form of essential infrastructure, should it be provided privately? And if so, how should it be regulated? And that's not just a question of economic theory and financial plumbing, but also a fundamental question of political theory. And privatization is from this perspective, not just destabilizing or potentially destabilizing, but also a form of de-democratization from a normative perspective. And I would add that money is then not just simply a form of public infrastructure, but part of the infrastructure of the democratic project itself, which I think makes it fundamentally different from other pieces of infrastructure. Okay, so let me, um, let me conclude here um, and uh, just kind of say a little bit more about, you know, the peculiar impasse we find ourselves here in the interregnum, kind of stuck in a position that is quite peculiar and I think uncomfortable, where we have to recognize with Marx that capital rules supreme, that capital has not only been able to survive, but has been able to take advantage and to thrive with each crisis. Like any analysis I think has to begin with that recognition. And yet it's important to acknowledge at the same time, as Marx's contemporary Walter Badgett already put it, that, quote, money will not manage itself, unquote. All monetary systems need governance. And that inevitably raises political questions over who gets to decide who governs and based on what values. And so in other words, finance needs the state at least as much as the state needs finance. And I think in the face of this impasse and interdependence, the double task has to be to conceptualize, to theorize and strategize over that interdependence. And I think one way to do so is to develop better conceptual and normative tools to describe and criticize the politics of different monetary systems. Now, crucially for me, that means that we have to move beyond the kind of quite misleading choice between depoliticization versus repoliticization of money or central banking, which is how so much of the discourse tends to be framed. Instead, the depoliticization of money is, I think, better understood as a de-democratization, 
So that means that even if we're skeptical or worried about recent politicizations of money and monetary policy, it's crucial to appreciate that this is itself a move on the chessboard of the politics of money. So even where it announces itself as an anti-politics, money is always already political. Now, that doesn't disqualify calls for the depoliticization of money, but the underlying values and the underlying goal has to be articulated and defended in the language of politics. Inversely, calls to repoliticize money are empty and even potentially reckless if they fail to articulate what kind of politics is meant to be injected. But what is the normative purpose of calls to repoliticize money? What's the tacit conception of politics that underwrites such calls? Is it to bundle power in one hand, or is it to open it up to democratic decision making? I think there's an urgent need in light of this for a more precise language to articulate the trade-offs and conflicts associated with different political conceptions of money but also for an enlarged imagination of what a more democratic, a more just monetary system could look like, both domestically and internationally. And that will no doubt have to entail also grappling with why money seems to resist that effort as long as society remains as it is. So the task here is to explore both the possibilities and limits of a more democratic politics of money. So let me wrap up here and just leave you with a question. Is it still true today that democratic money is bad money, as the MIT economist Rudy Dornbusch put it in 2000? Or can we do better? Okay. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the discussion. Great, many thanks in, indeed, Stefan. That's a terrific um, lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I just want to... Uh, I, I'll bring in some questions from the chat, but I just want to um, start with a, with a few of my own. I thought it was in, in, incredibly interesting, and you raise all sorts of questions. And I, I think perhaps it'd be, it would be really good bef before we finish the session today to explore a bit more about that challenge you pose at the end about what, what what does it mean to think democratically about money and what kind of society or political normative ambitions does it entail? And perhaps we can come back to that. But I wanted to just to. Um, you started with um, uh, money as debt and the promise to 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 to, to repay debt, and you, you showed that picture of um, of Solon and, and Croesus. One of the um, uh, one of the reasons why Solon, the ancient Greek, the or the Athenian legislator, is so famous is not only that he, as it were, stabilized the coinage, but but wrote off debt, and created a new, if you like. Um, institutional settlement for Athenian democracy or what was to become Athenian democracy. And I, I just wonder if you could say a little bit more about this relationship between the sort of politics of money and political order and debt, particularly as societies like ours after the financial crisis, after COVID um, are now uh, experiencing very high levels of both public and private debt. Um, and arguments have been made in a sense that Private debts were shoveled onto the public balance sheet, uh, but but each has ballooned. And um, what this relationship tells us, if you like, about about the sort of political economy of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my my guide to so much of this um, on this particular point is Keynes, you know, who I think grapples with this and and moves uh, into a position where he has a kind of quite paradoxical take on debt as simultaneously you know even more important than anyone thought it's all about it's all about just the provision and control of credit and debt and um and, and that's where that's where you know fundamental decisions about you know how society values individuals and things will be made you know um and at the same time uh despite or maybe because of that importance that goes alongside a kind of acknowledgement which has roots in solon that when debts have become intolerable they have to be shaken off yeah. So, so it's that simultaneous awareness of how debt is the tool that credit is the tool that we use in order to make, you know, all kind of allocative decisions, not just in the present, but in particular concerning the future. This is like I'm, I got very interested in this in the climate context. You, know, you can really see where priorities are and what goes wrong if you look at the kind of, you know, where credit is flowing. Um, mm. So, so that that's that's the the heart of the way in which our societies um, assess and distribute value. And at Absolutely. the same time, there, there need to be political constraints 
on debts that have become either intolerable, intolerable in their scale or kind of toxic and pernicious in the kind of activities that they allow. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the kind of, um, um, yeah, it's, I don't sure it's a paradox, but there's a tension between the two in letting the system operate and, and um, using it while at the same time, you know, not preventing oneself from stepping in in moments when things have really gotten out of kilter through, you know, radical debt reforms. This is the kind of position that Keynes ends up adopting after World War One, and again and again. Um, you know, this, this is, this is um, an option that he's willing to consider, unlike many others, that yeah. debts that have become, um, you know, unbearable for society just uh, you know shouldn't shouldn't burden us anymore that we at this point we have to let go of the moral weight of of debt and credit yeah. Yeah. thank you Stephen. that's that, that's great um i just want to i'm, I'm going to come on to some some questions in the chat in a, in a minute but i just I, um i want to just ask you about a, a related question really which is what what happens when a currency is debased that that um if 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 you like if if a national currency or uh a, a, a currency devalues such to the to, to the degree that um, uh, it becomes a worthless currency. Uh, if money is po is political, what does that tell us about the politics of societies that arrive in the, at those situations where effectively their currency is, currency is worthless and they can't trade on international markets or they suffer hyperinflation to the to the degree that um, some kind of restabilization of coin recoinage. Mm -hmm becomes required so i suppose I, I you know you talked in your lecture about, about how stabilizing currencies becomes a political project of a certain kind but what does a what does the debasement of a currency tell us about politics yeah i think that's where you see the kind of hybrid nature come out most clearly because a devaluation can be an exercise of actual um, agency right like unlike in a system like the gold standard where that's not possible where you just tie it to an international standard at a fixed rate and you know you just have to incorporate all the kind of sacrifices necessary to to adhere to that standard a system that allows for devaluation either through you know a system that has pegged exchange rates that are then adjustable um, or some other system that allows in some way it's actually a system that allows for some age political agency you know, that takes into account the system okay this exchange rate no longer adequately reflects um what's what's going on here and at the same time it's obviously political agency always in response to economic pressures. You know, it doesn't operate in a vacuum. Um, and in some instances, you know, those two can align where an act of political agency in the form of a devaluation actually aligns with the underlying economic dynamics and, you know, it generally produces what you would like it to produce politically. Yeah. But obviously, you know, we're all familiar with the inverse case where the two become dislocated, where devaluation ends up, you know, or as a reflection of a spiral of a currency kind of dwindling towards zero, in which case the, the, the political act becomes increasingly symbolic and tragic and a farce. Um, you know, where, the, where the result is not a kind of regained position of stability, but just another step down a road of, you know, eroding value of a currency. Mm -hmm. So none of these political uh, moves that I discussed, you know, happen in um, a non-economic space. The challenge is to kind of, again, theorize this dependency between finance and the state, but also between politics and economics. I think we, we have many of the economic tools to think about this. What I would like to do is not replace them with the political considerations, but just attend to the kind of political theory of money that is also involved in, let's say, a devaluation. Both the act of you know, agency, the symbolic value in this, which can you know, change depending on the context, like so many things in politics. Very few things have a, a political value inherent to the act itself, but it depends on what you're responding to, whether it is actually out of your own initiative or forced, whether this is seen as a, a move out of strength or weakness, an assertion of identity rather than imposition of identity. And mm. I think you know, we need to complement the you know, very rich monetary economic theory that we have with a greater attention to the kind of political thought that frames some of these. Yeah, that, that that doesn't happen in a vacuum. So that's the two together that we need. Yeah, great. That's great. Uh, um, I want to just go to some questions now. Then, so, um, already, Charles, where do you see the issue of trust in the meaning of money? So, money as a, as a trust relationship. If you, if, if, for example, the ability to service a debt. Let, if that's one question. I'll just take another one, and then perhaps 
we can go on answer them. Um, and James Cope say, would you agree that the myth of money creation is a technical act controlled by bankers to support efficient allocation of capital has been underpinned by a broad political consensus in favour of economic growth? And if so, how does post growth thinking affect that? Uh, and did Keynes pick up any of this in his discussion of the economic prospects of his grandchildren? Okay, so let me take these in turns. Great questions. Mm. Um, so trust is, I think, intimately linked to this account of credit money. I mean, that's where the credit comes from. It is essentially an expression of collective trust that underpins this. Mm. Now, and that that's what makes it so fragile. To go back to the discussion of debt, with um, which which we just uh, started our conversation, mm. you know, in order for trust to exist a system of credit to be underpinned by trust, there needs to be some kind of contractual liability. There needs to be a sense of, you know, trusting someone's word, prom believing someone's promise. And yet, and this is the Keynes point, if you stay too literally with the insistence on contractual obligations and promises, a system of trust can collapse paradoxically out of an, ins an excessive insistence on enforcing contracts and not voiding them when they have become you know, too strenuous. So a system of trust is stuck between these two tension between on the one hand, wanting to honor the, the promises that we make while recognizing that they can only operate in a context in which the trust actually serves society, in which the system created out of trust actually does what it's meant to do rather than serving a, a small group that has somehow met, managed to benefit from it. But it's, the entire history of the political theory of money is a history of trust, of the kind of economic dimension of trust. Um, so that's what comes out in Locke most clearly. It's what comes out in Keynes's critique of Locke. Um, and I think it's another way of, um, of uh, framing what I just said a moment ago about how to add political theory to economic theory. That you know, political theorists have, have thought about the notion of trust and legitimacy maybe a little bit more carefully than some, some economists. And so we need to mobilize that rich body of literature, mainly coming cons out of law, actually, as also a kind of institution suspended mm -hmm. between trust and violence. Um, and you know that, that body of thought, I think, has a lot to say on, on questions of monetary politics. Now, the second question, which I think has two parts, like the first part is just to, to acknowledge the, the premise um, that the act of money creation by private banks is you know, the dominant form of money creation. And it's one that only I think in this moment of interregnum has really gained a certain kind of public consciousness, not least because central banks themselves, and I think the Bank of England has really been at the forefront of this, have started to explain how money creation actually operates. I think there's a much greater awareness today of how private money creation contributes to our monetary system than there was before the financial crisis. And that has raised all kinds of demands and struggles. And I think that that's all very healthy. Um, I'm not sure how that will play out in the context of debates over degrowth. Um, I think it's not so much about credit creation, good or bad, as much more about where will the credit flow? And one of the major promises of private money creation was always that banks would be better, more efficient at uh, capital allocation. Now, if that's no longer the case in a world in which we don't want credit to flow to fossil fuel industries, but rather to you know, industries that facilitate the energy transition, if that is uh, you know, a market failure on an existential scale, then the whole premise of private money creation at being more efficient at capital allocation simply doesn't stand anymore. And we need to be able to control where credit flow or inversely be able to block uh, credit flowing to industries that actually harm achieving net zero. If private money creation prevents us from doing this, there's a real problem here. And I think that's where a lot of the kind of demands for greater you know, public banking, public um, money creation and greater regulation over the kind of credits that private banks can create um, comes from, it, you know, it's essentially a black box. We don't quite know. We don't have any control over the individual decisions of credit creation. And that that's become an existential concern in, in a context in which it everything depends on financing and investing in the industries that can get us to net zero. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, so another question from uh, John Scholar. How do you factor in inflation into an argument about repoliticizing money? It seems there's a crucial lack of consensus about how inflation works, which means people can't agree about 
which aspects of monetary policy are positive or normative? And he's thinking of, e.g., neoclassical responses to modern monetary theory advocates. So what do you do with, with that when, when there's that disagreement about inflation? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, first of all, note how that actually completely flips around the standard framing concerning inflation targeting independent central banks. The standard narrative used to be, we can all agree that inflation is bad. We would like to have a central bank that just targets inflation and keeps it at the target. And because there's consensus, we delegate it. You know, delegation is the outcome of consensus. Actually, I would argue the opposite is true, that delegation is usually the outcome of a failure to reach consensus. It's precisely because there's political disagreement and conflict over what to do in the face of inflation, whether, you know, who, who is more affected by it, what um, measures one should take in response to it, that one delegates, precisely because it's too difficult to solve politically. Now, that might still be an argument for why we want to do it if we think you know, uh, it, it has an important value, but that's very, very different from the old narrative of it simply being a reflection of consensus. And once we, I think, admit that it's an outcome of a lack of consensus, you know, an honest account would actually open up um, that political debate and, and hear the kind of arguments and the factional divides between this. And you know, one way I think which this has played out is, um, not so much that we can have to reach agreement about whether inflation is good or bad, but that we kind of shift to which kind of tools are at our disposal to tackle parts of inflation that we can all agree are egregious. You know? so, so parts of, of the cost of living crisis you know, target specific forms of inflation, you know, having to do with um, energy, for example. We can mm. all agree, you know, if, if you can't afford to warm your house, that's a real problem. We don't need to debate about whether inflation is good or bad overall, but we can all agree on that. And then we should have a policy that targets that rather than a kind of blanket raising of interest rate that artificially pushes an economy into recession um, as our only tool available in order to tackle inflation. So you see how actually the, the debate becomes more nuanced and the tools become much more kind of fine grained in tackling specific problems rather than inflation overall. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, let's just see. Let's just see. If we've got a, we've got five minutes. Let's just we've got time for another couple. Uh, there's a question about the influence of money in politics. So how, particularly in the in the U.S., political campaigns uh, dominated by money and undermining democracy. Um, another question about uh, whether I think whether you know basically as you were saying in your talk, Stephanie, you know, cryptocurrencies represented a response to the financial crisis, and then a, one that followed, which is that essentially cryptocurrencies have become a form of a form of speculation rather than, um, as it were, as you said, sort of a stable unit of exchange. Um, I mean, just on the cryptocurrency point, you mentioned in your talk, I mean, and in your book, you have a discussion of Hayek and famously debated with Keynes um, and uh, and the call that which we've heard a lot, um, particularly on the, if you like, on the sort of right of politics, either to return to, you know, sort of gold standard type measures or to denationalize uh, money to allow competing currencies. And I don't wonder if you'd just say a little bit about that, because obviously that was for a lot of people, the advocates of cryptocurrencies was was precisely that, wasn't it? This is Hayekian attempt to enable the market to flourish uh, absent of the political steerage that might be exercised by public authorities. Yeah, great. Um, let me start with the crypto question and then um, I, I work my way uh, back. But so on crypto, something really peculiar has happened ideologically uh, alongside the shift from the promise of money to um, speculative asset, which is that crypto has started to use the language of democracy much more overtly. There's now a lot of talk about kind of democratizing finance and crypto as a, as a way to, you know, democratize money and so on. And, you know, it obviously looks kind of very crude and kind of cooked up by some marketing department and like Robin Hood trading or so. But I think it's kind of it's striking what a deep appeal it has had, both among economists and the wider public um, of just like it's kind of access, uh, democracy as access. And I think part of that actually goes back to the original promise of, of crypto coming out of the financial crises, right? So there's, there's the Hayekian strand, but there's also, there was always a kind of more cypherpunk strand of, of crypto that actually saw decentralization as closely linked to democracy. 
Mm. Um, I think, you know, we see kind of here vague, distorted, farcical echoes of that coming up. But that was really a utopian promise of crypto believers in the wake of the financial crisis. And I think it's just important to recognize that that project has failed. Um, you know, it, it was a utopian one from the beginning, but you know, that's not how it turned out. Um, for the Hayekian side, you know, the, the Hayek project of denationalizing money um, has, I think, a kind of slightly awkward relationship to crypto because, yes, it wants to remove from the state, but from higher perspective, it places all the trust in banks, which was not a popular move in the, in the wake of the financial crisis, not least because there was a recognition of how close banks and states had become. But in Hayek's system, there's a faith that just banks competing with one another um, will essentially solve the problem of stable value, that it's, it's going to be competition among hundreds of different thousands of different currencies issued by hundreds of different banks that will um, you know, allow the market to, to produce an efficient result. Now, you know, we now know that that banking, like so many other industries at that frontier, you know, is subject to, you know, various forces that mean that what we see uh, don't tend to be markets, but highly oligopolistic structures with a few large competitors, almost all of which end up being state backed. Um, you know, so a picture very, very far removed from the Hayekian idea of the market. And again, you know, I can understand the utopian appeal of this, but if you just look at what happened to banking since the 1970s, since that call was issued, that's mm. not the history of banking, you'll find, you know, they, those are not the dynamics. And so I think, you know, uh, as much as, um, as it's helpful to turn to these utopias, both on the left and on the right to kind of open up to our imagination, it's important to then study the kind of forces on the ground, how finance and the state interact and what kind of power structures we're actually dealing with. Uh, in order to identify, you know, which promises, which uh, proposals actually have any plausibility in that context. And I think both the Hayekian and the cypherpunk proposal has largely failed on that account. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so okay. what was the question before? The, we had no, one last... Well, that, 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 I mean, it was related to, 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 to there was an issue just about the domination of uh, politics by money. Um, yeah. Just really just a question for democratic politics. One final one, if I may, Stefan from uh, Matt Dixon, which is just this, you know, the other the other phenomenon since the financial crisis um, has been quantitative easing uh, and more recently quantitative tightening um, by, you know, central banks, uh, I think in the UK, something like 875 billions of sterling. Um, given that the central bank is a public authority, is this in any meaningful sense private debt? And, you know, what is to stop us saying, well, Let's just write all of that off. Um, why should we be? Why should we think that there is uh, debt held on the uh, on the accounts of the Bank of England or the Fed, um, when in fact they are public authorities that have created this in the first place? Yeah, I mean, it's tempting to see this as you know the the reimposition of the state. The state emerges again as this entity that is able to blow up its balance sheet and act with agency. And that's where all these calls come from for people's QE. Why don't we use this for something else? Why don't we use it for the energy transition? Um, or also inversely, like what, what stops us from just uh, writing it off? I, I think what, what um, prevents us from doing that is that it wasn't ever purely public in the first place, but that precisely it was a response to mm. that hybrid nexus between private and public. I think Daniela Gabor has done the best work on this in showing how many of the kind of actions that we associate with kind of, you know, ebullient central bankers, public authorities, the, the state stepping back in, you know, they were actually responding to calls from the private financial sector to do something, right? So this was not the state imposing its own agency. This was the state serving capital, mm -hmm. uh, including by blowing up the balance sheet and providing liquidity. Mm -hmm. um, so, so rather than just like, you know, as much as I, 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 I am looking for moments of uh, in which we can reassert, you know, a certain sense of, you know, public control over money, many of the existing structures exist to serve the financial private sector, both mm. in moments in which it balloons and in moments in which it makes it very difficult to kind of uh, sl slim that down again, or let alone just like cut it, as you can see in the whole debate about the taper tantrum or um, mm. the kind of quantitative tightening, which was immediately ended the moment it actually started to hurt banks. Mm. And so, so again, this is a moment of interdependence where it seems mm. we're really dependent on the financial sector and any attempt to actually change what central banks are doing on their balance sheet would have to begin 
by changing what financial actors demand and are able to demand from us, why they are able to demand this, what kind of power they're able to exercise in getting us to do all these things. I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that you know the entire private banking sector is the only transmission channel for credit and monetary policy that we have. If you, if you want to manage credit, you rely on these banks to do this for you. And so any um, threat from their parts that they will not be able to do what you would like them to do is, uh, per, stops you right in the tracks and, and ends the debate. And so yeah. that has to change first for a debate about the, the balance sheet of central banks to actually have a meaningful uh, dimension. Yeah. Yes, I think and Adam Tooze has written recently, hasn't he, about the sort of dependency of the Fed on JP Morgan and the, you know, the growth of these huge mega banks, Daniela Gabor on de-risking and what that implies uh, in terms of the state's relationship to the private banking system. So, you know, hugely interesting, important, very relevant, as you say, contemporary questions. Um, I'm afraid we've run out of time there, but th that was just a, a fabulous talk, Stefan. We're really grateful to you. Thank you so much for giving us your time today, responding so uh, fully to the questions and for your lecture. I want to remind people in, in the chat, um, my colleague Julia was mentioning that there is a uh, a code you can use from the uh, publisher um, uh, for the uh, for the book. It's E one C two three, and you'll get a thirty percent reduction uh, at Princeton uh, Press for for Stefan's book. So I, I would encourage you to go uh, out and buy it with that uh, with that special code. I think there's even a fifty percent spring sale right now. <laughs> oh, okay, so fifty. Okay, well there we are, fifty percent sale. At, uh... um, uh, anyway, it was a real pleasure. I'm so I'm so grateful to be here, and thank you for those questions and the the moderation. Just great. a real pleasure to be here. Well, thank you so much, Stefan. And um, uh, just to say to everybody, please do keep in touch with IPR and, and the remaining lectures we have in our Polycrisis series. Um, one of our uh, our next one, our, I think our next guest speaker is P Professor Larry Bartels, uh, who'll join us on the 14th of June, June to talk about his new book on populism and how democracy arose from the top. So do join us for that. Uh, but for now, thank you very much indeed, Stefan. Uh, we'll let you get back to your day on the East Coast uh, of the US. Thank you all for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick.